Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Exodus, beginning at the 14th chapter and the 13th verse. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army and his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. And so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other so that one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. And so the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them and went after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. And so the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. And so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Our epistle lesson this morning is Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Finally then, brethren... We urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. And as we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanliness, but to holiness. And this morning's gospel comes from the book of Matthew, beginning at the 15th chapter and the 21st verse, a Gentile shows her faith. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. 
And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Jesus answered, And said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, joke telling is certainly an art. Even at a young age, a child will attempt to say something funny to make an adult laugh. And the first joke that many kids share with one another or with an adult is, Why did the chicken the road. Now what makes the question strange or funny is not a witty punchline, it's not clever, that the answer is so mundane that to say to get to the other side is not humor at all. It's funny because it's not funny. And kids take this and they expand upon it. They'll say things like, why did the turkey cross the road? What's the answer to that one? Do you know? You ever heard that one? Oh, I remember we used to say this when I was a kid. Because the chicken was on vacation. And then there was also, why did the chicken cross the playground? Anybody know that one? To get to the other slide. (laughs) Now, before we groan about too many Laffy Taffy jokes here this morning, one of the ones that was actually clever that I remember from my childhood was, why did the bicycle refuse to move? Anybody know that one? Why did the bicycle refuse to move? Why did the bicycle refuse to move? Because it's too tired. Jokes are a thing that you can enjoy when you know the language, but they're difficult to translate into other languages. And especially even when it's in your own language, then you feel really silly. When somebody shares a joke and everybody's laughing and having a good time, don't you feel stupid when you still don't get it? Now, language is usually a form of communication but also can serve as a mark of distinction or division. For example, uh, native speakers of English uh, will write things differently. In North America, we spell the word tire, T-I-R-E. But in uh, Europe, they spell it T-Y-R-E. Now how about when you add a prefix to the word tire? When you say the word retire, now if I said to you, I think I'm going to retire, my vehicle, now most of you would probably think, oh, he's not going to take out his car on a spin anymore. You wouldn't think of actually taking off the tires and putting on the new one. It's also dependent on the context. Now this morning we are going to think on a different kind of tire and a different kind of side, as in to get to the other side, but we're not going to talk about jokes. We're going to talk about Jesus meeting a woman from Tyre and Sidon, which are two cities close to each other. And the two parties that met Jesus and his disciples and the woman and her daughter, they lived not really all that far from each other. Geographically, they were not distant. But culturally and religiously, they were as different as could be. Now, Jesus and his disciples, they came from present-day Israel. And the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter, they lived in what is now present-day Lebanon. Now, Israel and Lebanon our neighbors today, like they were in in distant times. But why are they so different today, just like they were so different two millennia ago? Now, one of the basic narratives of the Old Testament is for the children of Israel that they were called to be a separate people. But they didn't like being a peculiar people. They wanted to be just like everybody else, like a group of high school teenagers wanting to conform one to the other. They were supposed to worship only God who would rescue them out of Egypt like we heard in our Old Testament lesson this morning. But God's chosen didn't want to stand out. 
they had to. And there was distinction there. Because we remember as, as those Israelites left the wilderness, God had promised them that land, he had promised them Canaan. The, the Lord had given specific instructions to Joshua when they would fight the Canaanites. He said, if they surrender, fine, take a tribute from them. But if they rise up against you, be done with them. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 15. But of the cities of these peoples, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive. But you shall utterly destroy them. The Hittite, the Amorite, the, Can the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. Now that's a pretty serious command, is it not? If they take up arms against you, if they just won't immediately surrender, take them out. Talk about driving a hard line between Israel and its neighbors. Now some of the Canaanites must have surrendered because they continued on. The children of Israel also carried on in their new land, but here again, they didn't want to maintain their separate identity. We read that Israel implored Samuel to give them a king, and Samuel tried to dissuade them. Your king's going to lead you into war. Your king's going to raise your taxes to pay for that war. No, we still want it. The children of Israel had rejected God. They hadn't rejected Samuel. God told them they had rejected God because they wanted a king. And that rejection continued to solidify all throughout Israel's history. Now, King David had secured peace for Israel, creating uh, friendly alliances with his neighbors. And because of what David had done, Hiram, the king of Tyre, made a trade deal with David's son, Solomon. Now, the king of Tyre agreed to float cedar logs down the river from Lebanon to Israel for construction of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, these good relations seemed beneficial at first, but Solomon made too much of these alliances. And he married foreign wives and brought them into his court and built houses of worship for their pagan gods. And things continue to decline. We continue going throughout the Old Testament. A handful of generations later in Solomon's lineage, this time we arrive at the times of King Ahab, who married Jezebel, the queen of Sidon. And Jezebel promoted her native religion, who worshipped Baal and his female consort, Asherah. And the situation became serious enough that we read in the book of 1 Kings that Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to a contest atop Mount Carmel. And the prophet Baal lost when the rains fell when Elijah prayed. Here again, there was a serious consequence. This wasn't just a, we shake hands and we're done with our conflict. But when the fire fell down and the crowds were amazed, what did Elijah do? But he ordered the crowds to seize the prophets of Baal and to take them out. Now, if I remember right, it was 5,000. I can't remember for sure, but it was a great number. Many of Jezebel's priests had been slaughtered. But she remained zealous for promoting her fertility religion of Tyre and Sidon, that she ordered that the prophets of God, the true God, should be killed. And Elijah therefore fled into the wilderness, and he was fed by ravens for a while until God led him to a place called Zarephath. And where is Zarephath but in the region of Tyre and Sidon? Just like at Mount Carmel, Baal lost again. Not only did the Sidonian priests, not only were they taken out, but the monarchs promoted that false religion were also taken out. We read that Ahab was wounded in battle, and the dogs lapped his blood. And then in 2 Kings 9, we read that the royal officials defenestrated Jezebel. Defenestrated, that's a word that means to throw out a window. And she wasn't even buried soon enough that the dogs came to her body and ate it up and all that remained was her skeleton. The relations between the Israelites and the Tyre and Sidonians was often very complicated. And we see the same history, the same repetitions of events into the New Testament. 
It's quite a backdrop, is it not, to bring to the story today of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Now, as we begin to examine that story in itself in Matthew chapter 15, we read that she's identified as being from Tyre and Sidon, but also that she is a Canaanite. And we remember again that what a Canaanite was, the ones who were there in the time when Israelites were entering into the promised land. This is Matthew 15. The story of the Syrophoenician woman also comes in one other place in the Bible, and that is Mark chapter 7. And in Mark chapter 7, this woman is identified as being a Greek and being a Syrophoenician. Now here she already had labels on her. She already was an other. Now she has some more labels. Why was she called a Greek? Don't the Greeks live in Greece? And that's not that close to the promised land. Well, the only army who ever conquered Tyre and Sidon was the greatest military leader of all time, Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was a man who championed Greek culture and language to solidify his empire into one being. And he was the only one who had successfully conquered the city by taking the stone remains of Tyre and making some type of like passageway that he was able to advance his armies into the city. It's a city that's surrounded quite a bit by water. And he was the only one that's ever been able to do that in ancient times. He Hellenized his society, and that means that he made it Greek. And Israel was not immune to this Hellenization. God's chosen people wanted to throw off their special status once again. In the times of Hellenization, the men tried ridiculous things. that They tried to reverse their circumcision. The Greek general Antiochus Epiphanes IV sacrificed a pig in the temple and rededicated it to the god Zeus. Finally, the Israelites were awakened to how far they had gone astray when not even their own temple was no longer sacred. And so finally they woke up and threw off foreign rule. Now the Phoenicians had been conquered by the Romans and the Greeks before them, but they made a great contribution to the world. While they were certainly other in the eyes of uh, the Jews, there was something very significant about their culture as well. See, between the cities of Tyre and Sidon, in the region of Phoenicia, there is a city called Byblos, B-Y-B-L-O-S. And Byblos was an early leader in the production of papyrus, which is an early form of paper. So the papyrus industry from Byblos became associated and was named for the production of books. And so we call our scriptures the Bible because they are a book, a collection of 66 books of scriptures fashioned after the original process of having an industry of book making. And the Phoenicians were also the first ones who produced an alphabet that we still employ in our world. Now in the ancient times, the most primitive form of writing was something called hieroglyphics. A, a picture would stand for an idea. Like if you wanted to represent the idea of a bird, you would draw a little picture of a bird. But the Phoenicians developed an alphabet that lasted that it was not only about a picture, but they developed characters that represent sounds. And that's what our alphabet is still today, thousands of years later. And so that is remembered as well. And we acknowledge that contribution. When we're studying words in English, when you're trying to learn how to spell, what do you learn? Phonics, Phoenicia. When you speak to one another with your cell phone, the telephone, phone, Phoenicia, same thing there. So these are people who had made a great contribution. These were not just some backwater folks. But the disciples and Jesus were not excited to hear the voice of that woman, that Syrophoenician woman coming and talking to them and pleading with them in her desperation. Matthew 15, 23 says that Jesus didn't even answer her. And the disciples said, send her away. She's crying again. Now why were Jesus and his entourage so loath to have to deal with this frantic woman? Now if we were going to turn back in Matthew 
in the last few chapters before we remember this was our sermon for last week too if you were here was that Jesus fed the 5,000 men and the women and the children who weren't counted in that total and the people were so taken in by his miracle that they tried to make him king by force and Jesus wanted nothing of this so he and his disciples got into a boat and fled and as the story continues they encountered this great storm but Jesus was so tired he was sleeping right through the thunder and the lightning and they had to wake him up so that he could calm the wind and the waves and then they finally landed on the other side and the crowds recognized him so they laid person after person before him so that he could lay his hands on them and heal them now, we didn't hear this in our reading today from Matthew, but if you go to Mark, we get a little greater sense of Jesus' weariness. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 says, And from there Jesus arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered into a house and did not want any man to know it, but he could not be hidden. So they were trying to have their own space. He was exhausted. He was a human being after all. He wanted some rest. He went to Tyre. Because he was tired, you could say. But Jesus and the disciples were not in the mood to have company, let alone a screeching woman. But the, her case was so compelling. And the King James Version says this, expresses this, communicates this so well. She said to Jesus, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. That sounds like trouble, does it not? They weren't in the mood for it. But she wasn't going to let all that negative history between her people group and Jesus' people group stand in the way. So the disciples were cranky. And Jesus made a statement about wh for whom he came. And then he spoke the fighting words that we would think sound like they're words of negativity, words of uh, contention, whatever phrase you want to put on it. That's not what they were, but th could you not see? Could you not imagine how this woman could have wrongly taken these words? Jesus said, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. It's not right to give the children's food to the dogs. Jesus spoke hard words there. And we can get a sense of this in the English language too. If there is one way you want to insult a woman, you can make a reference to a female dog. We get the sense how, how harsh these words were. This wasn't a uh, casual conversation. But the Syrophoenician woman was not deterred by Jesus ignoring her and seeming to maybe even insult her. She was desperate. She had probably sought doctors. Uh, she probably had gone to her own religious officials. And they were of no help. Jesus was all that she had left. Well, she came from this proud Phoenician heritage, a heritage of writing and reading. She quickly recognized her inferior status before the Jewish Savior. And here she was, a, a foreign Phoenician woman in the company of Jesus and his 12 disciples. That was not a balanced equation, shall we say, in ancient times of context. She knew that the Jews considered her dirty and unclean. She maybe was even expecting that she would have to do something like this, that she would have to really advocate and fight, and that she wasn't going to take no for an answer. But she had the right posture, because she threw herself on Jesus' mercy. Lord, have mercy upon me. And then she showed her faith. She demonstrated that she wasn't just in this for a quick fix. She responded with humility. True, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. See, she realized her inferior status. She admitted she's a beggar. She probably felt humbling to acknowledge her lower estate. And this is what she had to do to find help for her daughter. But she realized that Jesus' response to her had a great history behind it. She would have known all this. She knew that she was not part of God's chosen people. She knew that there she was different because she said, son of David. That's a Jewish type of plea. She realized that Jesus was all she had, that she needed his intervention. And so she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. 
this time, Jesus had quite a different reaction, did he not? Instead of using more separating language, instead of showing space between himself and the woman, he affirmed her strong conviction. He replied, O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you as you will. And verse 29 says, And the daughter was made well from that very hour. So Jesus didn't even go lay hands on this woman. Not that he didn't want to, but she had such strong faith that she trusted that Christ could speak those words from afar. Just like, you know, when the Roman centurion came to Jesus and said, uh, my servant's sick. And Jesus said, okay, I'll go in to be with him. And the, he says, no, 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 I'm a man who gives orders. Just say the word and he shall be healed. And this is how it was here too. Both of them foreigners, both of them not Israelites. Both of them accepting their outside status. They saw something in Jesus. Yes, he came for the lost sheep of Israel, but the lost sheep of Israel, God choosing Israel to be his beloved, there was a plan in it all. It wasn't an end in itself, and that's what the Pharisees didn't get. They couldn't understand it. We have Abraham as our father, they said. But no, it was a means to an end. God chose Israel to reach the whole world. God was training his disciples through Jesus Christ not to just minister to Israel, but he made them not only disciples, but apostles. Think of the end of the book of Matthew, the end of the book of Mark. What does Jesus do? But he sends them out, go into all the nations of the earth, preaching the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, what a change of trajectory we see in here. We see the beginning of Jesus' ministry coming to its fullness. Yes, Jesus came to focus on the lost children of Israel because he was training those disciples so they would be ready and to go out. But she saw something in him. She understood it deeper than those disciples even understood. And when you think of it, what a blessing that she realized that and that Jesus actually did not only come for the house of Israel, but in the sense that he came to train his disciples because we are Gentiles too. As the scriptures say, we are grafted in. How much better to have the peace of Christ in your heart. Imagine what our lives would be like if we were still pleading and placating Thor and Odin to send down rain upon our crops, to hoping for some type of survival through the next winter. Those of you who have grown up in the church, we have a hard sense of this sometimes because we think of ourselves as being the insiders. We think of ourselves as being the ones who that God has established as being the home base. And uh, particularly for you, I'm sure some of you, know, like you know, you, Green Lake Lutheran has been your church your entire life. And praise God for that. And some of you have grown up in another church and you've been baptized as a child and you've grown up in the church the whole time. But yet... We are outsiders too. Not because distinctions of Jewish and Gentile are important anymore, but because we are sinners. That we need God's grace. That we stand in that inferior position, just like the Syrophoenician woman did. That's why we start out our service each morning by uh, having a confession of sin. And then we have words of, Lord, have mercy. Because even though we maybe have been doing this our whole lives, maybe you've been in church since you were a child, we are still separated from Christ without his mercy and grace and the cross. Now, the Syrophoenician woman could have claimed to uh, feel offended by what she had heard. She could have appealed to her status as being, well, I'm a Ph Phoenician, you know, and we invented books and we invented an alphabet. I mean, she could have had all these things, but no. She understood her condition. And this is what Jesus calls each one of us to do too, to be repentant. Because we're not worried about Jew and Gentile. That's been taken care of. Remember the words of Paul in Galatians 3, in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew or Greek. But there is one distinction that, we, that each one of you still has and will continue to have in your life until you reach heaven above. And that is the identity of a sinner. It's the only really important distinction that still exists in this world. The only important distinction that really exists in our lives now 
is whether you plead guilty or whether you try to justify that you're a good person after all. You try to pretend that you are innocent, that you're good enough. It's the only distinction that's ultimately going to matter. Now, we live in a day and an age where there are lots of distinctions, and everything is so loaded, and every term is so controversial, and we have to watch our mouths to be so careful just to not say something that's offensive. And there may be good reasons for that, but sometimes there are not. And if we would just get to the job of truth-telling and tell people and remind ourselves as well that we are sinners in the need of grace of God, now, many of you are not going to be like the apostles and receive the kind of training where you, you know, spent three years with Jesus and are sent out to go into different places all around the globe. But Jesus is still calling you to speak his word to those who do not know him either. You maybe will not board a ship, become a missionary, but you have neighbors who do not know the Lord. And while their addresses may be only a couple numbers different than yours because you live next to them, what kind of forwarding address do they have? As Pastor Dyer would, uh, likes to make that claim that sticks in our mind so well, what kind of forwarding address are you going to have in eternity? There are only two choices. There's no in-between. No return to sender. Two options. Acknowledging your lost state before God or saying, I'm going to try to make it on my own. And so we continue to witness to all whom we encounter, our neighbors and our friends. Now, when your neighbors and your friends are gone, maybe you help them out. Maybe they ask you, will you come uh, feed the dogs when we're gone on vacation? Take care of the pets? But you'd be a much greater service to them, even greater than all those things watching their house up, call the fire department if their house went up in flames. You would be a much greater service if you invited your neighbors over for supper. But also, that together, you would feast on the crumbs that have fallen from the master's table. That you would point to them and say, you might have a meal here to eat. I've eaten at your place and you're a better cook than I am. But are you eating from the bread of life? Do you know Jesus Christ to be the one who can feed not only the needs of your life in this age, but for the life of the world to come? Don't be offended by this, neighbor. I'm saying this to you because I love you. Look to the example of the Syrophoenician woman. She could have stomped away being all hurt by not being immediately acknowledged by Jesus. But she heard words of truth. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do. He didn't insult her personally, but he spoke to a condition that exists, a history that was there. And so God calls each one of us to, that we would speak some hard but true words to our neighbors and speak them to ourselves too when we confess our sin. But Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. You know that story in the scriptures where there's two men and one says, Dear God, thank you that I'm not like those other people over there that you have given me this and this and whatever. And the other one says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. So my prayer for each one of you is that you would acknowledge your true condition before the Lord and that you would point other people to share in those delicious crumbs.